do you think this will, you know, be not um, challenging for you at all? I certainly understand if you want to sign out, but let me ask you, um, what would you like to see in an intermediate class? Um, I, I, for me, it's like uh, reading patterns. Yeah. So actually, I'm glad you said that because that's the other class that I'm currently developing is the how to read a knitting pattern and how to choose yarns. That one, I believe, is actually on, on the schedule right now. So if yes. you go to the website and put my name in there, um, it'll pop up. Um, so I, I saw that they, they sent, hi, Phyllis. I saw that they sent- Hi, how are you? Great. I saw that they sent it live yesterday. So, um, so watch for those, Virginia. I, those sound like they'd be more up your alley. Okay, thank All you. Right. Yes, you're welcome. Hi, Anna, how are you today? I'm fine, I'm just trying to learn a little bit about knitting. Okay, are, have you ever knitted before? Um, very little. Okay. I, I am knitting a blanket, but having a little bit of problems. Okay, well, maybe this class is for you. What stitches yeah. are you doing in your blanket? Do you just know? a regular knit. Just garter stitch? Just yeah. Knit. No, okay. This yeah, I've actually, I've actually put three pieces. I, I don't know how to do a regular, like the full amount. So I did three sections of it, like 60 by 90. Okay. Now I'm trying to put the three pieces together to make one big blanket. Oh, that, you know, I'm glad you said that because I could put that in my intermediate class. We won't be covering how to join pieces today. Um, but yeah. once I learned how to join pieces, I can join them and they, you can't even tell. Yeah. So it's, it can be done. Um, you yeah. might just look on YouTube for joining knitting pieces together. Yeah. And see if well, you I'm still, find... I'm still trying to learn. I mean, I'm using it mainly for my eye hand coordination. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, Wonderful. I and make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It, the, it, yes. And that's okay. When you're learning, making mistakes is a good time to do it, right? Okay. <laughs> yes, it is. Good morning, Liz. I see you've joined us. What are you hoping to learn today? Um, well, I'd like to re revisit my knitting skills that have been dormant for many years. Okay, then you're Thank in the you. right you're in the right spot. Great, right, I'm just guys. learning. Okay, yeah, Phyllis, I, I you were with me for knitting before, yeah. No. Oh, you haven't done knitting with me. All right. No, I've done crocheting with you. Okay. So, all right. So, you, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna share my screen and get going. I want you all to know that I am very, very, very excited. And I may have a little tiny bit of trouble concentrating because I had a granddaughter born yesterday, five weeks early. Everything's wow. great. We left our home in Michigan and drove to Dayton, Ohio, where, where, the, where she it was our daughter-in-law that had her. And so then my other daughter who lives in Chicago called me at seven o'clock this morning she is she was in active labor and and two minutes before i signed on to teach i got a picture of my newest granddaughter all right <laughs> so i'm pretty excited i i hope i can concentrate you i know you'll understand my excitement though so um i'm pretty i'm pretty i'm a pretty happy grandma right now I would be. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, well, thank you for joining me today. We're going to be covering the knitting basics, learning how to knit. I'm Sarah, and I'm your host with Get Set Up. Um, I, I normally I live in and uh, and uh, launch from Everett, Michigan. However, today I'm coming to you from Dayton, Ohio. I spent 22 years in education. I'm a recently retired elementary principal. One of the highlights of my job was teaching for Michigan, or I'm sorry, being a specialist for Michigan State University for a couple of years, helping uh, schools in Northern Michigan who were academically behind, which was definitely, definitely a highlight of my career. I live by quotes. I love quotes. This is one of my very favorites of all time, and that's people do the best they can with what they know, and when they know better, they do better. And what that means to me is I can learn. As long as I can take a breath. I can learn something new. 
Um, and I am on that journey, even though I'm an older adult now. So when I was scrolling <laughs> through my Facebook feed back in January and I saw Get Set Up and began re researching it a little bit, I started taking classes through them. And I realized that their philosophy of reaching older adults is harmonious with my own. And so I reached out to see if I could teach some classes. And with that, here I am. So, um, you know, I, I, um, I just feel like it's a great partnership and I'm glad to be guiding these classes. I'm going to put my phone, I forgot to make my phone silent. Let me do that real quick. Um, so one of the things about Get Set Up that's really neat is we learn from each other. So I know that I have already learned things from other participants in my classes. And I know I have things to share and I enjoy sharing them. Ideally, I can see you when the cameras are on. How that helps me is when I'm teaching something like learning to crochet or learning to knit, and if you have a frowny face, I know that I'm not getting something just right. So that helps me when I can see your face. But certainly if you wanna keep your camera off, that is, that is up to you and I, I fully understand. If you're joining by live stream, and I understand we are live stream today, if you're joining by live stream, welcome, I'm glad to have you on board. But I want you to know that if you wanna participate uh, two ways with me, um, if you want to, um, be able to come and ask questions and show me what you're working on or or what have you, um, hop on over to the website, getsetup.io, and sign up directly for a class. And that way you can be in the Zoom class and participate fully. Get Set Up is not paid to promote any specific products, nor am I. But as a crafter, I've developed certainly some favorite uh, products, and I can't help but share those. Just know that when I do, it's not because I'm endorsed to do so nor is get set up. Um, if you have questions, we're a small class today. So just unmute yourself and ask. If you're shy, type your question in the chat box and either Joe or I will try to uh, monitor that, which um, reminds me that I have Joe on board with us today. He's my teacher slash technical assistant. Um, Joe, would you like to say hi to everyone? Hi, everyone. Hi, Joe. Hi. So, uh, Sarah, can you please do one thing? I've made you the host back again. Can you make me the co-host, please? Make you co- Oh, yes. Yes, I sure can. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Um, I just have... Oh, there we go. All right. Okay, Joe, I think we're, I think we're good to go. Thank you very much. Yes. Whoops, let me go back. I'm, I accidentally went forward. Okay, so this is what we'll be covering today. Basic supplies, uh, how to choose yarn, that type of thing. Um, if you've taken my crochet class, this will be a repeat for you on the yarn. Um, how to make a slip knot and cast on. Um, and how to do a basic knit or the garter stitch and how to bind off and weave in your ends. Um, I know because because uh, most of you have responded that you're either a brand new knitter or you're a refreshing knitter. So I appreciate that feedback that helps me know how deeply to go with the content. Um, these are the supplies that you might need um, to knit. So you're going to want a pattern. Um, most people knit with a pattern um, and pattern reading is a class that I'm actually uh, developing and will be launching in two weeks. So if you're wondering how to do a cro how to read a crochet pattern or a knitting pattern, uh, it's already on the schedule and you can sign up for that now. Um, it can it's a little bit like breaking a code, right? The pattern part of it. So um, so that I, I, I'm finding that that's where some people get stuck is in reading the pattern. Um, we're going to talk, uh, or you'll need some yarn. You'll need knitting needles. You'll need some scissors to cut your work, and then optionally. You'll need yarn or a darning needle to weave in your ends, stitch markers, and a stitch counter. And we won't be using any of those three things today, except perhaps if you get a swatch done while we're, while we're working together, um, you might want to weave in your ends with a, a yarn, a darning needle, or you can also use a, uh, a crochet hook. So these are knitting needles and just knitting needles alone can be a bit confusing because there's so many. So let's talk about these for just a minute. There's really three basic types of needles. There's a circular needle, which looks like this one right here. There's a straight needle, which is all of these that are up here. 
And then there's uh, these double pointed straight needles and then there's cable needles. So I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about each of these. So a circular needle is generally used for two types of projects. It can be used, Anna, this is something you might wanna know. Um, it can be used for a very large project like an Afghan to keep you from having three separate pieces um, and having to sew them together when you get done. You can use a circular needle, um, which will hold. So I, like the ones I, the circular needle that I use for a project that you'll see at the end that I share with you, I, I use this for an Afghan. And the circular needle allows you to store your stitches on the nylon or plastic cord, um, but still allow you to have your hands close enough together that you're not ramming into your chair ends. So the circular needle, is nice for big projects. It's also sometimes used for tubular projects like a, a sweater that doesn't have side seams or perhaps a hat. Um, but if you're gonna go very small, like uh, my sister-in-law knitted some golf club covers um, and um, uh, hold just one second. Um, so like golf club covers or a little tiny baby hat, socks are often knitted on double pointed needles, although there is a circular needle technique out there now. Um, but that's what your double pointed needles are for. And they, uh, the double pointed are for circular projects that are very small. I would consider this an advanced skill, not a start, not a beginner's. You, you don't want to start a project that has double pointed needles in it that, that requires multiple needles because just uh, managing everything is a little bit difficult. So get your basic knitting skills down and then switch to a uh, more complicated project. Most often, a lot of patterns are going to use these straight needles and they come in uh, usually in two different lengths. Although I've been noticing lately when I go to the store that they only are selling this length, which is about a foot long. I also have some in my, um, my uh, stash at home that are about 18 inches. What I don't like about the longer straight needles is they, I like to sit in a, uh, I sit in an upholstered rocker and the longer needles run into the arms of my chair and I don't like that. So I, if I'm going to do a, a project that requires bigger than the standard size needles, I would switch to the circular needles to get the same results. And you'll notice the other thing you'll notice on here is the needles can be very small or very large. The largest needles I've ever sewn, I've ever knitted on are approximately this big around and my son made them for me to make a blanket for him using uh, what they call super bulky yarn. Um, and um, I, 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 I just, I just couldn't find big enough needles for the yarn that he wanted me to use so he literally made them for me and they're quite fun to have. And then finally we've got the cable needle down here and what a cable needle does is it holds one or two, maybe a little bit more stitches at a time. And what you would do is you would put your stitches on the cable needle, hold it forward or push it to the back, depending on the, what the pattern says. And you've seen the sweaters that have those beautiful twists that run up them, that's a cable. Um, you would never use cable needles by themselves to knit. They're only, um, they're only meant to do just a couple stitches at a time to form that stitch. So um, that again, that would be an advanced skill. Do you have any questions on the needles before I move on to yarn? Okay, I'm gonna hit this part relatively quickly um, and not spend quite as much time on this as I normally would because I'm actually moving the yarn section to my pattern reading class um, because I wanna get in a, I wanna get into the proper depth for people to understand but I'm finding that this part takes a long time in the, in the beginning knitting class. So I'd like to pull it out and move it to that other section. So I'm gonna hit this relatively quickly. For today's work, what you're gonna want is a size four yarn. It usually is on the label. Um, it, it used to be called different things like worsted weight, or I think the four came from calling it four ply yarn. But now uh, any yarn that you buy today normally has this number on the label. It's a great size for learning to knit. And what it's describing is it's describing how big around 
the, an individual strand of yarn is. That's so four is what they consider average. Now, it does go from one to nine these days, nine being super bulky and one being super fine, um, but uh, average is still four. Um, and four is what most like box stores, like a Walmart, they're gonna carry four in either the acrylic or in the um, cotton and the 100% cotton is what we'll be using for the demonstrations today. The other things that are, so you've got the, the, the weight or the how big around the strand is in this icon right here. You've got the weight of how much yarn is in here. You've got the weight on here and you've also got the length and the pattern often tells you um, what you need. It might say, you know, you need nine ounces, or it might say you need, you know, 560 yards, or it might say both. Um, just know that what you need to know is if it says, for example, this is this has seven ounces. If it if you need nine ounces to finish your your project, buy it all at the same time because yarn oftentimes also has what they call a dye lot. And if you buy yarn today and it's not in the same dye lot and you go back three months from now to buy more, there can actually be a slight shading difference um, and it'll show up in your finished work, especially if you're doing something that's solid color. I've had this happen to me twice and it's so in both on Afghans, very disappointing to see that shade difference later on. So I tend to overbuy rather than underbuy. Um, and then I just keep it in really good shape, um, like in a bag, um, in, a, in my, um, yarn bag in my yarn project bag and I, I try to keep it you know clean and neat and then I will return it when I'm done um, and most of the time I've never had a store not take it back uh, if it's in a timely manner so um, just know that uh, know that and the other thing you want to look for is the fiber content and the laundering instructions this one happens to be 90% acrylic and 10% alpaca wool uh, a Walmart or a Target or a Meyer or whatever your big box store is, it's probably, most of it's probably going to be 100% acrylic, which is a great starter yarn, or 100% cotton. I like the cotton for the dishcloths. Um, so that's what I'm going to be teaching you with today. It's also going to tell you about gauging. And I, I, this, this is the part of the label that tells you about gauging. I'm going to move to a close-up of that. So this is a different skein of yarn. Um, than, the, than the previous one, but I want to just give you the basics. So it tells you gauging for both knitting and crocheting. Um, and, and they show it this way. What, but let me tell you what this means. What this means is if you have this yarn and you have size nine needles, which are 5.5 millimeters around, um, that if you cast on 16 stitches and knit for 22 rows, your swatch should end up being four by four. So that's, that's what I'm gonna be uh, showing you with today is my four by four swatch. Now, where this is important is if you're making a dishcloth, it really doesn't matter, right? As long as you get a dishcloth that's the size, that kind of the size you want, it doesn't really matter a whole lot in an Afghan. But if you're knitting a sweater for yourself or someone else, or you're knitting a, uh, I did American Girl clothes for a while for my um, for my niece, and um, I had one that I spent a lot of time knitting, and it literally fell off the dowel. So um, so just it's important to swatch if it's important to fit after you're done. So you just you just make this four by four square and measure it. Now you say to me, well, what if it turns out three and a half by three and a half? Well, that means that you're a tight knitter, and you may want to go up from a nine to a 10. Or if it turns out overly large, like let's say you do this and it turns out five by five, you may wanna go down a size uh, on swatching and gauging. This is a little bit tricky to understand. All right, so for today, we're gonna to be using 100% cotton yarn, uh, a dish. You can make one to two dish claws out of one of these skeins, depending on how big you make it. So any medium weight yarn size four would work um, and which is medium weight or average, like I had mentioned earlier, you could use acrylic if you have it. 
Um, but I prefer cotton for the dishcloths. I just don't care for the acrylic when I'm trying to wash dishes with it. But to learn to knit, it's a, it's a fine piece of uh, yarn to use. We're going to be using those straight needles, size eight, that I uh, showed you before, and you're going to want some scissors. Um, feel free to follow along with me, or remember, if you want to order a copy of this video when we get done, um, you can email help at getsetup.io and say, I'd like a copy of Sarah's class today, Learn to Knit, and they'll send you a recording. If you're here participating with me, they'll send you a recording of the whole class, and that way you can queue it up and watch, for example, how to cast on. You could watch it over and over again. Uh, which when some of the, the hardest part to me learning to knit is the coordination that it takes to get your, your knitting needles and your yarn all working together. So to me, that's the, that's the challenge. Um, okay, any questions on the supplies? Okay, this is the pattern that I use today. It's very, very simple. Um, we're going to cast, and I'm going to send you this when we're done. Um, don't worry about it. If you just want to swatch, you might want to try to get 10 or 12 stitches on your needle. Um, we're going to cast on 36 stitches, which is abbreviated CO36STS. CO is cast on, STS is stitches. You're going to knit every row for 48 rows or until it's square. So when I did it, this is my dishcloth. When I did it, I just did it until, so if my knitting needle was up here at the top, I just did it until my corners met. And that's when I, that's when I did my binding off. Um, so because you may be a tighter or a looser knitter than me, it's not an exact science. So 48 is approximate or until it's square. And that would be abbreviated K for knit every row for 48 rows or until square. And then you bind off, which is abbreviated BO, 36 STS, which is stitches. And then you're gonna tie off and weave in your ends. Now, I just wanna, uh, as a disclaimer, some people also say cast off at the end. I, um, I've always preferred the bind off at the end because to me, I don't like how close cast on and cast off sound. Um, but some patterns will say most, the majority I'd say by I would say the majority use bind off, but you will on occasion see cast off. And I don't want that to confuse you. It's when they say cast off, it's the same as bind off. So this is how you start the yarn from the um, skein. And I am gonna make sure I got my setting. This is uh, how we find the center of our skein. So this is a skein of cotton cro crochet. Uh, yarn Can you hear it? Okay. Uh, different than uh, an elongated yes. skein. This one's more elongated. This one's a little more squat, um, but they work pretty much the same way. Um, think of this as one really, 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 really long piece of thread um, that's wound around, around, around. So there's the outside uh, end and there's the inside end. The outside end is not a good one to pull from because there's no smooth way to unravel it without rolling the skein all around. So my favorite way is what I'm gonna show you right here. And that's that you kind of poke into the center. You keep poking, poking, poking until you get as close to the center of the skein as you possibly can. And then I take my finger and my thumb and I reach inside there and I pull out with my Thumb, um, a piece of, of yarn and I can see now that I've gotten down to the single pull um, and so I look and lo and behold there's my thread end um, and so this is where I want to pull from. Once I use up this little extra that I pulled out it will pull freely from the skein without the skein ever moving and you can use almost your entire uh, skein without ever getting a knot and without the skein ever rolling. So that's the beauty of pulling from the center. Any questions on uh, on handling the skein? I've had a lot of people ask about, do I need to make it into a ball? 
Um, and a ball um, generally is not needed. If you use a skein of yarn that's like the one that I just uh, demonstrated and pull from the middle, you don't ever have to ball. Sometimes I will still ball it because I just enjoy uh, balling my yarn, but you, you certainly don't have to when you pull from the middle. I, again, I'll say pull from the middle because if you try to do it from the outside, your, your skein just bounces everywhere. And that's when you can pick up dirt and lint um, and, um, and uh, make it dirty. Um, and so it's worth it, I think, to, to figure out how to pull from the inside. There is one exception that I'm aware of, and that's if you go to a specialty yarn shop and they still have like your hand dyed wools would be a perfect example. They're still sold in what they call a hank, um, a hank of yarn, which looks like I've held my hands, you know, apart like this and they've wound the yarn around and around and around. And then it looks like they took it off, twisted it and folded it in half and then put the label on it. Um, but if you get that kind of yarn in a yarn store, they almost always have the machine to ball that right up for you so that you, um, you can go home with a, with a skein that you can pull from. So um, I just want to add that, just that little tidbit to picking out your yarn. Okay, so we're going to do the slip knot. The process is very similar to the one I showed in crocheting, but you put Excuse it on. Me, Sarah? A, yes. We have a question in the chat uh, from Phyllis. She asked that, oh. how can you tell the difference between the needle size six and nine? That's a great question. Um, does your needle, Phyllis, also say millimeters underneath it, underneath the number? Uh, I can't read it. <laughs> is it. Is it there? I see a, a um, either a six or nine with a line underneath of it. The line is the bottom of the number. Okay, so the line is the bottom. Okay, that's what I want. Yeah, and oftentimes that's one of the ways that you could tell the difference between a six and a nine. Another way that you can tell it is like on the end of mine, it says it says eight. And obviously, I can tell it's an eight, right? But right below it, it says five point zero millimeters, and that's right side up. So I know that if I'm holding it that way, it's going to show me. But that line is always on the bottom of the number. Okay. And if you know, if you that's and I'm glad you said that, Phyllis, because if you don't have a size eight, but you have a size nine, use it. If you have a six, use it. Um, sometimes, though, the six is a harder one to learn on because it's tiny. So which do you have? Do you have the nine or the six? I have the six. Okay. It's kind of tiny. Is that all you've got? Nope. Let me be back. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, let me show you how to make the, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I see a couple of people going to grab uh, uh, knitting needles and that's okay. I want you to be successful with this if it's at all possible. Liz, do you have any questions so far? Okay. I got an eight. Great. Oh, perfect. Eight's better. Liz? Nothing? No. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right, so um, the slip knot's different than crocheting in that crocheting, you put it right at the end, but in casting on and knitting, we do a double strand. So that's what you're Oops. gonna see here. So for today's uh, knitting lesson, I've selected a tail that's approximately two feet long. Um, and we'll call that end right here. This is the tail. It's about two feet long because I'm going to cast on about 18 inches on a size eight pair of needles. Can you hear it? I'm using cotton um, yarn. Uh, this one happens to be Premier Home um, and size eight needles. And I'm going to start with a slip knot. Slip knot. I do like this. I go around with my fingers, making a loop like this. And then I take that loop off my fingers and I push the tail through from behind, making a loop. And then I gently kind of pull and tug and pull and tug until I've got a slip knot that's like that. Then I simply slip that slip knot onto my needles. And now I've got my two foot tail left along with my working thread, which is going to my skein of yarn. And I've tightened my slip knot down so that I'm uh, ready to begin casting on. 
stitches. Any questions about the slip knot? Now don't, if you can't, if you can't figure out the slip knot, don't let it be a showstopper, right? Make, just make a little loop with a knot um, because it, it's probably, of all the things that you're gonna do in knitting, it's probably the very least important. So if you can't get it, just make yourself a knot under your knitting needle so that it's the right size. Okay. Now, somebody asked me, how long do you make the tail? And I said, I just always make it longer than I think what I'm going to need. So I don't run out. And then I trim it off if I want, if I, you know, if it, if my extra is a little bit long, but that made me look it up online and there actually is a rule of thumb. So it's if your finished project. So my dishcloth ended up being about, I'm going to say about eight inches wide. It's about eight inches. Um, so you would go four times the width in inches. So if it's eight inches wide, four times eight is 32. Um, you would make your tail 32 inches. Or if it's 10 inches wide, you times 10 inches by four and make your tail 40 inches. Now I'm assuming that's for a size eight needle. I didn't say that in the rule of thumb, of course, because I think if you were using my great big knitting needles, that would not work. But I think probably if you're in that six to 10 range, that's probably a perfect calculation. So I was kind of glad to see that. That was a neat little tip. Okay, so this is how we're gonna cast on. So let's go. Now there's really um, two parts to think about when you're casting on stitches. Uh, the first is how you hold the knitting needle. And the second is how you hold the thread itself. So I hold, when I'm casting on, I hold my knitting needle like this. In other words, I'm not holding it like a pencil. I'm holding it more like I would hold a knife or something that I was going to um, slice or cut with. So, and then I, I put my pointer finger on that slip knot that we've already put on the needle. So this is what I'm doing with the needle. And then I take the thread, which is now two strands, and I grasp that thread with my lower three fingers, and I divide the two strands between my pointer finger and my thumb. So if I'm looking at it from this direction, it, it looks like this, but I'd like to turn it sideways so that you can see, I almost think of it as a diamond where this is the top of the diamond, these are the two sides, and down here I'm holding on to the bottom of that diamond. And this is where, this is what you need to do to cast on. It's a little bit tricky, so stick with me. So I'm going to pull my thumb up into the left, exposing the thread here. And I'm going to take my needle and I'm going to go underneath. And actually, if you can kind of see it, it's like it's a loop on my thumb. So I'm going underneath that spot or through that loop. And I'm picking up the tail thread that's back here. And I'm bringing it back through the loop. And then I tighten it down just like I did the slip knot. So there's two, so let me do it again. Grab a hold of those two threads between my, with my bottom three fingers. And then with my pointer and my thumb, I separate those two threads, making a diamond shape. Then I bring my knitting needle all the way to the front while I bring my thumb, my left thumb up to the left, and I go through the thread wrapping this back thread or the tail around it from the top to the bottom. And then I come back through the loop, tighten it down. One more time, grab it with my fingers, separate the two threads between my forefinger and my thumb. While I'm pulling my thumb up to the left, I'm bringing my yarn down underneath, going through the loop that's on my thumb going over the top of the thread that's on my forefinger and bringing that back through the loop that's on my thumb and tightening that down. There's four, so I'm gonna do a little bit faster. 
thumb up, through, wrap, through, pull. And do it again. Through the thumb from underneath, wrap from the top to the back, through, and off. Again, through, wrap, through, off. Again, through, wrap, through, and pull. Now, what I'd like you to notice about the few that I've put on here so far is I'm trying to keep my, my loops that are on my needle fairly evenly um, distributed and with an even amount of tension on them. And that makes it easier and more neat when you actually go to start knitting. The other thing that's important about this uh, part right here is that, um, that you not do it too tightly or A, it's going to be difficult to knit your first row and B, it can actually pull your work in unevenly. So you want this to be a little bit of a looser tension than you might do for your actual knitting. Okay, any questions on that? So how do you keep it loose if you tighten it oh, too tight? Uh, hold on, I, mean, really... I didn't mean to do that. Um, so Phyllis, what I do, and I, I'm always hesitant to tell this to brand new knitters because it, it may be a little bit confusing, but what I do when I'm using an average size needle is I put two together. I cast on over both. I pretend that this is one needle, even though it's two. Right. I pretend that it's one. I cast on over the two, around the two needles. And then when I get done, so let's, what did I say? 35 or 36 for the wash. Right. Off, then I would just remove one by sliding it out, you know, sliding it out this way. Um, and that keeps my cast on row uh, a lot looser. Another thing that you could do is let's say that you're using a size eight needle. Um, and you happen to have a 10 or an 11, you could cast on on an 11 and knit your first row with the eight. And that's going to keep that cast on row looser and a little bit bigger too. You, what you really, truly, it's, it's such a common thing that brand new knitters do is to cast on tight because you want to make sure your everything is secure. Um, and even, and then it pulls your work in. So I made a beautiful, beautiful sweater one time for myself using it. It was a finer yarn. And I think the needles were like fours or fives. Um, and the, I, I could barely get it over my head because of how tight I, you know, over my shoulders, not over my head, but over my shoulders <laughs> because of how tight I, I cast that on. Um, the other thing with trying to cast on loose is it's hard to keep your tension even and cast it on loosely at the same time. That answer that question for you, Phyllis? Yeah. Okay. okay, great. The other thing is, is that, um, oh, I lost my thought. Um, hmm, lost my thought. That happens, right? <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So, oh, I know what I was going to say. The reason there is a single strand cast on that's a little simpler cast on to do. The reason I have, I have learned that other cast on, but the reason that I, this would be my preferred type of cast on is when you're using two threads, I feel like it gives a more secure um, edge. And the other thing is, is if you've ever, you know, think about when you put on a sweater that's knit. And you, you grab a hold of your hem and you pull down. Well, you're pulling down on that edge. So I like the double thread cast on for strength. I think it's going to make it pass the test of time a little bit better than the single strand uh, cast on. But that's just my opinion, my preference. All right. Okay. And if there's no more questions on the cast on, Anna and Liz, are you good? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move to the how to knit video. I'm going to skip this part. I'm just telling you about the size of yarn I got. That's on here. So this is tall. Okay. So here's my uh, needle. And I've cast on 18 stitches. And you just simply count them by counting the loops on your needle. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Now, remember, I was working with the uh, knitting needle in my right hand while I was casting on. But to actually begin knitting, I'm going to turn the needle and I'm going to put it in my left hand. And I'm going to scooch my stitches up kind of close to the tip, but not all the way to the tip. And, all, and also you'll notice I do still have a bit of a tail left, about hmm, oh, probably close to 10 inches there. But that's okay. I can always trim it off or weave it in. Um, and I'd rather have more than less, by the way. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to begin knitting now. And I want to show you that how I hold my needle in my left hand is the same way I hold the cast on needle in my right hand before. So I've got it held in this kind of knife way. And I've got my first stitch just um, probably a quarter of an inch back from where it starts to taper right here. And um, I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm really counting on these three fingers to do the bulk of the work in what I begin doing. So this is, is the hold that I'm going to be using. And what we do with the right is again, hold it in that same hold, the right needle. And we're gonna go into this first stitch from the left side of the stitch through through the center of that stitch to the back. And then kind of, I, and you can see I've totally removed my right hand and now I'm holding everything with my left hand. And I'm going to pick up and I'm gonna make sure that I'm picking up the yarn that is attached to the skein, the working yarn and not the tail. Um, and I've done, made that mistake many times. And I'm going to, using the working thread, I'm going to wrap from behind in a counterclockwise position. I'm going to bring it down uh, through, through or between those two stitches. And I'm going to hold it like this while I work that stitch through and off the needle. Now I can see right there that my thread split and I don't like that. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that stitch over again. I'm just gonna real quick, I'm gonna cast that back on. Don't like those split stitches at all. And I'm gonna go through from the left toward the right. I'm gonna make sure I've got my working thread. I'm gonna go around the needle counterclockwise through between those two, pulling it snug between those two needles. And then I'm gonna bring this back needle to the front. And I'm gonna scooch the stitch off, just slide it off to the right, and there's my first, uh, my first knitted stitch. Okay, so now I'm gonna scooch it up a little bit closer to the needle. I'm gonna go in from the left to the right, and from the front to the back. I'm gonna wrap the yarn counterclockwise, pulling it snugly between the two needles kind of holding that thread with my right hand. And you can see what happened with my pointer finger. I'm, I'm assisting the needle back through, pulling the loop from the back to the front, and then pulling the old stitch off by pushing to the right. So through from left to right, front to back, wrap and hold, pull that thread through, push the old stitch off. So let's do it again. Okay, so through, wrap counterclockwise, pull that thread through, push the old one off. So through, wrap, through, off. Through, wrap, through, off. Through, wrap, through, off. All right, I'm going to be quiet for the um, through, wrap, through, off. Now you do it. Through, wrap, through, off. Through, wrap, through, off. Through, wrap, through, off. Through, 
wrap through off. And I've almost got my 18 stitches knitted. And my last one. Okay, any questions on the knit stitch itself? And that's called the knit stitch or the garter stitch. Those are the two names for that. So in general, knitting is a, like a large umbrella category. Anything you do with two needles could be called knitting, no matter what stitch it is. But also the knit stitch is what you just learned. And, and if you knit every row, it's called the garter stitch. It's different than what we'll learn in the intermediate class, which would be the next stitch, which is purling, and then maybe some advanced stitches beyond that. So that's the basic. Uh, knit stitch. I'm going to show you now how to turn it. Now here is the end of the first row of knitted stitches and I've turned, I've, I've taken the, uh, remember when I finished I moved all of these stitches over onto the right hand needle. Now I'm taking that right hand needle, I'm turning it around and I'm going this way, putting it in my left hand so that I can knit row two. There's a couple things that I'd really like to show you about this, this row before we get started. First is to make sure that you count, especially in the beginning, and make sure you still have the same number of stitches you started with. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Yep, I got it. And that's the swatch, yeah. not the dish Very cloth. important part before you start your second row is to make sure when you pick that up, Remember, I'm going to scooch my stitches up toward the, the taper, and I'm going, to, I'm going to get ready to knit, but I'm going to make sure that my working yarn is straight down and to the back. And let me show you why. If you don't make sure that it's straight down and to the back, you can, in it, and you go over the top, look how all of a sudden, it looks like I've got two stitches to knit instead of one. So I'm going to pull these other stitches back and watch, watch, watch how those two stitches disappear when this thread is in the right place. So you always want to make sure your thread is down into the back when you get started on your second row. And then we're, um, we're going to be doing the garter stitch today. And what the garter stitch is, is simply knit every row. Um, and you can see what we counted the stitches that were on the needle, but you can see that we've got these bumps. And these bumps tell us that the previous row was knitted when we're looking at this side. So now we're going to knit row two, and we're going to do that the same way. We're going to go through the loop from left to right, front to back, secure it with our left hand. We're going to pick up that working thread. We're going to go counterclockwise through, kind of holding on with our right hand and assisting with our left. We're going to pull through. Oh, look, I've got that split stitch again, and I recognize it early. So, I'm... Okay, any questions on starting your second row? I've taught many, many people how to knit, and what I, what I saw right away was it, we were doing scarves on large needles for a while when the fun fur was real popular and I was teaching teenage girls and they would start with a scarf that was about this wide and they'd be six inches in and all of a sudden it would look like this and um, what I what I saw from observing was what I just demonstrated there so making sure you're right at the beginning of every row and then when you're beginning count every row make sure you still got the same number of stitches it saves you a lot of grief in the end I'm going to skip the video on counting rows and show you in another spot how to do that <clears throat> um, this is how you bind off so let's say that you've gotten to the end of your swatch or your dishcloth and now you're ready to bind off this is how you finish your piece I've completed my 24 rows for this swatch that I'm making for this demonstration. The swatch is 18 stitches wide by 24 uh, rows long. And I've got my um, working needle in my left hand and I'm going to bind off 
uh, holding pretty much everything the same and I'm going to be knitting, uh, the, there's one difference. So I'm gonna knit the first stitch just the same as I've knitted everything else going in from the left to the right and from the front to the back, wrap counterclockwise, pull it through, push the yarn off. And then I'm gonna knit the second stitch. So I've got one, now I'm gonna do two. And after I get that, those two done, I'm gonna bring my left needle over, pick up that first stitch and drag it over the top of that second stitch, pulling that first stitch off. And then I'm gonna knit the second stitch. Which is really now the so third stitch. The second stitch. Now I've got two stitches on the right hand needle. I'm gonna pick up the first stitch going from left to right. And I'm just gonna pull it over. See if you can see that, pull it over the second stitch and off the needle. Okay, so I'm gonna knit the next stitch. Which is now number four. Got two back over on that right hand side again. I'm gonna pick up this one. I'm gonna drag it over the top of that one and pull it off. Okay, so now I'm gonna keep doing that one stitch at a time. Knit one, bind one off. Knit one. Okay, now I'm gonna show you the end of the row. Okay, I'm down to my last bind off stitch here. I've got just one stitch, working stitch over here, and I've got the last stitch that needs to be bound off over here. I'm gonna knit that last stitch. Now I've got nothing left on this needle, but I still need to take this, this one and pull it over the top of that one. And then what I do is I take this needle and I kind of tug it so there's a bigger loop. I cut my yarn. Just put that yarn back through that loop. And I tighten it down. Any questions on binding off? my knitting. And then if you look, I've completed, completed my 24, just did my binding off. I've got a nice, even, kind of a V-stitched edge on there that's pleasant to look at. Okay, and then the very final step is weaving in your ends using the tapestry needle or a crochet hook. You can do the same thing with crochet hook. One of the final parts of a knitted project is what do you do with these leftover pieces of thread? Um, and the tendency might be to say, well, I'll just cut them off. And so if I came in here with my scissors and I cut this off right here um, with no, nothing more secure than that last little loop that I made, this could very easily come unraveled and then all my work would be lost. So um, you can do this with a couple different ways. Um, for this video, I'm gonna demonstrate using my yarn needles. This is my preferred um, way of, of um, weaving in my ends long enough to be able to operate this. So this is, these are, these are ancient in fact. Um, I got them from probably like a Joann's or something like that. And it says on here that they're steel yarn needles and they've got this really great big huge eye on them which is really nice and so i just take my my tail of my um where i cut it off and i put it through that needle and then i decide where's my front and where's my back i'm going to actually flip this over and you just take this and you just you just wind it through and i i go what i tend to do is i tend to go up and down up and down and I go through a minimum of five maybe more stitches and then I just I stretch it a little bit and then I trim it off and now I've got a much more secure end. Any questions on weaving in the ends? Anna, you had mentioned joining the, you know, your three strips together when you get done.
that yarn needle is what I would recommend for doing that rather than trying to use a crochet hook. Um, what you're going to, what, if you look at a video on that, they're going to show you how to find the bars in between the edges and you just, you picking those bars up with that needle and it works really, really well with a yarn needle as opposed to a crochet hook. It, and, and if you can, you know, once you see the technique, it's real easy to see where those bars are. Yeah, uh, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so here's a recap. Uh, hold the needle with the stitches to be worked in your left hand, if you're left hand, if you're right handed. Uh, put the tip of the right needle in the left side of the first stitch, push through to the back, wrap counterclockwise, push the wrap yarn through the stitch on the left needle and push, push the old stitch off, leaving the new stitch on the right needle. So what I say to myself when I'm doing this is through, wrap, through, off. And that's how I remember it. I just say through, wrap, through, off. And that helps me remember what I'm doing. Um, we're actually, I'm going to save this. Um, so if you're interested in reading a pattern, um, sign up for my reading a knitting pattern class, which I believe is on the schedule for a week after next. And we'll go through this in detail. All right, the pattern that I used today used one skein of cotton yarn like the Lily Sugar and Cream. This was an off brand called Premier Home. A pair of knitting needles size seven or eight. Remember, you can go as low as six, as high as, as 10, and it's probably not gonna make a lot of difference, although I think six is pretty small. You're gonna cast on, to get the same size as I got, cast on 30, knit every row until it's as long as it is wide. Remember, I determined that by going corner to corner and then bind off and weave in your ends. And I'll send you this in the email that you're gonna get from me afterwards. Here are some things that I've knitted. I knitted this, I, I don't have a picture of the actual one that I knitted, but I knitted this for a blind girl. I, and I knitted it for her because she could feel the texture. And she was so excited that she, my secretary and I actually ended up teaching her how to knit and she mastered knitting as a blind person. Wow. Um, this is a vest that I made for my grandson. It has that cabling in the front that I was talking about earlier um, using that, that cable needle. Um, this is a little uh, top and purse I made for a, um, one of the American Girl dolls. This is a garter stitch jacket for this doll and a garter stitch hand, headband. So literally the stitch that you learned today is the only thing I used for this jacket and this headband. Remember I told you my, whoops, remember I told you my son uh, wanted a great big huge blanket uh, and he made me the knitting needles. This is the, the blanket. Uh, that I that I made for him and it sits on the bed uh, in his in his man cave. Um, this is a, an afghan I made for my grandson using cable stitching. This was smaller. I want to say this was oh maybe size five needles. It took quite a while. It was beautiful though. I was quite happy with it when I got done. These are slippers. I've made at least 50 pair of these. That's my husband's feet on the right hand side. You knit them with 100% wool and they turn out, oh my gosh, I bet they're a foot and a half long. And then I wash them in the washing machine in hot water and I throw in a pair of jeans and it felts and shrinks the yarn until it fits your foot. Um, and I have made, uh, the reason I've made so many is I've made them for family members and they have, um, they have requested more when they wear them out. So that's a popular pattern. This uses those circular needles. Anna, this is my method of doing an, a large afghan. These are those circular needles with the, you can kind of see the plastic in between here. That allowed me to have all my stitches on at one time and not have to do panels. Um, here's uh, resources if you want more information, Pinterest, YouTube. Um, you can start a get set up interest group on knitting, or you can join a knitting group on Facebook. I, I did this. I joined this called the Knitting Circle on Facebook. Um, this, uh, this knitting challenge is over, but they've got a new one going right now that I just signed up for. So that should be fun. So thanks for joining me. Um, I, you know, if you have any comments for me, please, uh, give me some feedback in your email. If you um, want to talk to Liz, you can email her at Liz at getsetup.io. Here's some of the classes that are related and that I'm teaching. Um, and oops, you'll get, you'll get that email. If you scroll down 
and hit this give feedback button. You can tell me how you liked the class today. Uh, you can rate me with stars. You can rate the class with stars. You can add comments. And down here, you can tell me general comments. You can tell me uh, classes that you're interested in. I read every word. So I, I really, truly enjoy your feedback and want to get better. We'd love you to invite a friend when you sign up for a class. And these are all things that you can do through Get Set Up. So what fi I'm going to stop sharing. What final questions do you have for me? Phyllis, can you do it? I'm going to try. <laughs> okay. And Anna, did you find anything new today? You're still muted. <laughs> She's still muted. There she I'm is. a technical more. Moron. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's giving me a refresher course on on okay. casting on. Okay. And stuff like that. Great, great. All right. Well, awesome. I'm gonna sign off. I'm gonna go and join well, the thank grandbabies. You. Thank you, everyone. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.